Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, we're going to do a pretty big study that I've been going through, and it's called, Was Paul a False Convert? Now, um, as we go through here, we're going to learn that, um, I want to say 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 38, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Okay? God will know that you're innocent when you're ignorant, but God will show you the truth, and at that point you're no longer ignorant. But there's some people who refuse to hear truth. And what does the Bible say? But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So, turn to Acts chapter 26. It's almost like an expository study, and what it is, is Paul is giving his testimony. If you read, uh, watch, not read, but watch one of the study I did about um, Paul, um, walk or talk, uh, it shows Paul's life and how he changed. But I wanted to do a study real quick on him actually giving his testimony and looking at it from his lost life. Was he a false convert? Okay. So, starting in Acts 26 1. 26 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. Okay. Preaching the gospel real quick. They're telling Paul, you can, you can, uh, you're permitted to speak for thyself. Sometimes, when you get in life, as a Christian, people are going to be trying to speak for you. And they're going to speak lies. They're going to speak hypocrisy. They're going to make you look bad. But in this situation, God bless Paul with being able to speak for himself. But uh, preaching the gospel, I wanted to go over some key points before we really, really get into this study. Romans 1.15, turn to Romans 1.15 and hold your hand there. Romans chapter 1. Not that far away. Verse 15. We're going to read 15 through 17. So as much as in me, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith. Okay? So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. So what's going on here? Paul is being given, an, uh, being given an opportunity to preach the gospel. Uh, Romans 10, 14. Fourteen and fifteen. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Notice that it says, um, Lest they be sent. We're going to get into it, but you remember, Paul was sent to the Gentiles by Jesus, by God, okay, to preach the gospel unto the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 9.16, for, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for, ne for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe unto me, if I preach not the gospel. We need to have that attitude. We need to be... Preaching the gospel, whether it's leaving gospel tracts places, having the courage, God will give you the courage eventually to start handing out the gospel tracts, and then it'll get to the point where God will point at someone and say, go tell that person about Jesus Christ. Okay? I've come across uh, people that claim to be Christians, and they say, well, I'm not feel, I don't feel called to preach the gospel. I really just don't feel called to preach the gospel. Or according to this book, you are called to preach the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Um, 
big point right here is everyone that I'm making on this next point, account of your life. Everybody is going to be given an account of their life to God. Jesus will be judging, saved and lost. Okay. Uh, the true gospel, we're going to get to it in a second. Uh, I do not preach or teach easy believism, and I don't preach and teach works-based salvation. Okay. Easy believism teaches you have to earn salvation, and of course, uh, work salvation people teach you that you can buy God's grace with your works. You can trade good works for salvation. So, Romans 14.11 Romans 14, oops, put back an extra page. Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone. It doesn't say lost people. Everyone. Okay? will be given an account of himself to God, an account of himself. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Okay? We have to give an account of ourselves. Uh, brothers and sisters, when we go to the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is going to be there saying, I paid, paid for his sins. Okay? His account is wet clean. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.10 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And notice it says judgment seat of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's talking about saved people. Okay. Verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Okay? We will stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ and answer for the good things we've done and the bad things we've done, according to God's perfect word, His righteous judgment. I had to bring this up for those that are lost, that are watching, they can understand, that they understand that you're going to have to give an account of yourself before God at the great white throne and be judged. And the punishment for so much as one sin is eternity in hell. You can't get away from that. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we will be judged also at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why that verse says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. I'm not looking forward to standing there at the judgment seat of Christ and having my life as a Christian not my past life when I was lost. That, I'm talking about my life as a Christian, having it be made known before Jesus and going through stuff that I'd be ashamed of, or I will be ashamed of. And it's just not something you look forward to. That's why by the terror of the Lord we persuade men. You realize you're going to have to answer for that at the judgment seat of Christ. You do realize Jesus saw that. Jesus sees everything, but he saw that with that person specifically doing Okay. So, what is the true gospel? Okay. Repent is the first step to finding salvation. I've always taught and I always will teach, salvation is God saving you. Throughout the whole Old Testament to New Testament, God's grace has always been salvation. God saving you. But how do you find that grace? I'll probably come over this verse again. Sometimes I jump ahead. But if, there's a verse that says, If the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In other words, if the gospel is hid, it has to be found. Okay. So, the plan of salvation, there's steps to find God's grace. And it's different throughout the different dispensations. But for the church age, what we call the church age... I know it's not in the Bible, but it's the time period between the death of Christ, where the New Testament comes in, and the catching away of the body of Christ. 
that happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. So what is the true gospel? Repent, 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Remember, a godly manner, that you sorrowed to repentance, and it was sorry after a godly manner. So there's two types of uh, sorry, sorrow that is um, that one will lead to a repentance, true biblical repentance, the other won't. Let's read about the second one. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. It happens before God saves you. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You can have uh, godly sorrow, or you can have sorrow of the world. And only one is, well, is true biblical repentance that will lead to salvation, and that's godly sorrow. So the first step is you need to repent. You and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have repented. Right? We've dropped our self-righteousness, we dropped our pride, and we come before God as a sinner and having godly sorrow for sinning against Him. Understanding we're on our way to hell and we don't want to go to hell. We deserve it. We drop our self-righteous and pride and admit, God, I deserve hell. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner that deserves to go to hell for sinning against you. And then that sorrow needs to happen here. It's not enough just to admit, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Are you personally sorry for sinning against God? And that means you're admitting that you're a sinner and you have sorrow for sinning against God. Okay? And yes, it's a fearful thing to be cast into the lake of fire. Anybody in their right mind doesn't want to go to hell. The next step that leads to salvation, God saving you, and these aren't works. It takes faith to repent. It takes faith to believe. And that's the next step. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures." Notice that there it says, you have believed in vain. I've always taught, and I always will teach, that if your repentance doesn't happen in the heart, the belief won't happen in the heart. Just admitting you're a sinner is not true biblical repentance. It's not the full entirety of true biblical repentance. You have to have sorrow for sinning against God. You're, just, uh, you're admitting you're a sinner, but you're also having sorrow for that sin. Then you can truly understand the price that was paid for you at Calvary. That belief is not in the head. If it's only in the head, then you've believed in vain. If it's in the heart, it's true belief, as far as what this is talking about. Okay? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? And understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is God, He is perfect, and it is God's blood that was shed on Calvary. And only God's blood can wash your sins away. That's the second step. Repentance that happens in the heart leads to true belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ, which happens in the heart. At that point, both of those happen in the heart. So what comes next? You've got to confess both to God. Why? Let's read it, Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with the ma thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, what did we just read in 1 Corinthians? You know, death, burial, and resurrection. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, means he believes before he gets God's righteousness imputed to him, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. What does that mean? It means it leads to salvation. In other words, confessing your repentance to God that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for sinning against you, I don't want to go to hell. That confession and confessing your belief, you are God fully and completely. 
You died on the cross for my sins. You paid the price that I was supposed to pay. And only through you can I find true salvation. You know, if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Okay? For the scripture, this is the part why you confess both in prayer. It says it leads to salvation. Verse 11, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. People like to take repentance out because they love their sin. They want to say, yeah, I'm a sinner, but they don't have sorrow for sinning against God because they like to justify sin. The true mark of a um, false convert is they'll justify sin. The mark of someone who's truly saved, and there's lots of marks that will prove that someone's lost, and there's a lot of marks that prove that someone's saved, but one of the big marks of proof is their attitude towards sin. They'll struggle with sin. They won't justify it. They'll be ashamed of it. Uh, they, there's times where you fall into the trap of hiding it and you put, start putting up a defense, like defending yourself, defending that sin. But you always get around to struggling with sin and confessing your faults to the brothers and sisters in Christ and you struggle with sin and you ask God to help you with those sins. So we found that repent leads to belief, true belief in the heart. And when you have both your sorrow for sinning against God and your true belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross in your heart, you're to confess both to the Lord. Why? To prove that you are not ashamed. The people that take prayer out of leading to salvation, they are ashamed of their belief. Okay? They, they skip repentance, this easy believism, they skip repentance and they are ashamed of their belief. So, What's the, the last step that leads to salvation? So far, none of this stuff is works. It takes faith. When you're confessing your repentance and your belief that happens in the heart, when you're confessing with your mouth, it takes faith to confess to a God that you can't see, a God that you believe is there and is listening to you. So the last step that leads to salvation, you call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10.13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. A lot of people will take that out. Why? Because the easy believism crowd believes that they've earned salvation with their faith. They've earned it. You have to save me, God. You have to save me. I've earned it. But when you call upon the name of the Lord and you ask him to save you, you're saying, I don't deserve to be saved. I deserve to go to hell. I don't deserve it. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, save me. You calling upon the name of the Lord is you showing God that you don't deserve it. And you believe that in your heart that you don't deserve to be saved. It's a blessing from God. It's His grace that saves you. It's not your faith. Through faith, but not by your faith. It's not you're saved by faith through grace. And that's what these faith alone people will do. And the works people will, will make, the they'll turn repentance into you've got to be perfect, sinlessly perfect. And the belief isn't that big of a deal. It's more important that you keep doing good works so you can trade enough good works to buy God's grace. So those are the two sides that we are fighting with brothers and sisters in Christ all the time because if you can throw something on this side and something on this side they can't see the true gospel they see a fake one if they're over here they see this fake one if they're over here they see this fake one the easy believism over here the works and the gospel is hid but if it's hid it's hid to them that are lost if you're truly seeking the true gospel in Jesus Christ and God he'll show you the true gospel if you don't want anything to do with the true gospel and you just love the system that you're in, then the gospel is going to be hid to them that are lost. But I wanted to throw that out there because we're going to read Paul given his testimony. I've given my testimony. There's other brothers in Christ that's given their testimony. But I believe this is Paul given his testimony. So back to Acts 26. We're going to be in verse 2. All right. Acts 26, verse 2. I think myself happy happy, King Agrippa, 
because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. It's one thing for me to say, King James Video Ministries, uh, Brian Denlinger, um, it's one thing for me to say, hey, he believes in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, got great teachings on it, he's solid. It's another thing for them to go to him to find out, and he can speak for himself. Yes, I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble. Here's some teachings on it. It is absolute truth. They always say, hear it from the horse's mouth. That's, the, that's how it's supposed to be. He's happy. Paul is happy to speak for himself. You have a lot of people today that try to speak through other people. You know, they don't want to speak for themselves. They're hiding. So, once again, Paul is glad to preach the gospel, almost like it's an honor. Because we've read some verses how, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.18, if you want to turn there. This is going to be a long study, so I'm going to be staying here, Acts 26, as we go through it, and be going through some other verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. You have to go through Jesus Christ to be reconciled to God. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Remember it talked about people being sent. They can't believe or even hear the gospel unless people be sent. Okay? We are the people it's talking about. Saved sinners. Ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Where do you find the gospel? Where do you find out about repentance? Confessing both in prayer. Calling upon the name of the Lord to save you. He's given us the word and of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Paul was being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I am happy, he says up there, I, am, uh, I think myself happy, King Agrippa. He's happy to preach the gospel, no matter what the cost. Okay? Acts 26, 3. Back to Acts 26. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Patiently. You're going to come across people who don't want to hear the truth patiently. Okay? They're going to cut you off. Um, they're going to have so many questions, like they just keep questioning everything. And you go to try to answer, and they'll cut you off with another question. Okay? Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Seeking it. But unto them that are contentious, like I was just saying, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. I kept going. But, okay, patiently. That's one thing as a, a Bible-believing, uh, God-fearing man, when it comes that people lack the courage, and I do too sometimes, is because you're always going to come across people that aren't patient. They're not going to be patient with you, and they're not going to want to hear the truth. So Paul is saying... I beseech thee, please hear me out before you make a decision. Hear me out, and then you can make a decision. Okay? I had to look up the word contentious. Apt to contend, given to angry debate, quarrelsome, perverse, exciting or adept to provoke contention or disputes. Like I said, instead of them listening patiently and hearing the true gospel, hearing the whole truth, and then making a decision, they'll cut you off. Okay? They'll start uh, debating. They'll get angry as they're talking. Okay? They'll get quarrelsome. They'll want to just start arguing. Okay? It's tough dealing with people like that. It takes courage. I encourage you, brethren, when you do, I'm proud of you. A lot of you have more courage than me. Some don't have as much courage as me. But God will give it to you. Okay? God will give you the courage over time. Back to Acts 26.4. 
So Paul's asking King Agrippa uh, to listen patiently. I beseech thee, hear me out before you make a decision. Acts 26, 4. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. They knew what kind of man he was before he got saved which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. He was religious. And as we read down here, he thought he was doing God's service. He thought he was doing what's right for God. He was very most straightest sect. And we're going to keep reading. I see Pharisees believe in the resurrection, spirits, and angels. They put traditions above the word of God. They believe themselves to be above the lady. They are the final authority. They're prideful and self-righteous. A lot of the Pharisees were like that. Paul, on, on the other hand, as you read, he was a Pharisee because he loved the he loved God and he thought he was doing God's service. Okay? So we find out he wasn't. Back to Acts 23, 6. Okay. Oh no, I'm sorry. Turn to Acts 23, 6. We're not going uh, we're in Acts 26. So actually. It's kind of confusing. 23, chapter 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. I can only almost imagine uh, Paul, because he's realizing that the Jews aren't listening because you've got the Pharisees poisoning them, and you've got the Sadducees, and God gives them wisdom and says, hey, play them against each other. This is evidence that the Sadducees, um, where he says, in the hope of the resurrection of the dead, am I called into question? And then the, Sadducee, uh, the Pharisees all of a sudden change their tune, and they're on Paul's side. If it be at God, let them alone, you know, and the Sadducees don't believe in it. No, he should die. And, you know what I'm saying? They start quarreling amongst themselves, and the soldiers take them up. If you read that story, I, I always love that when I come across that, and I think that um, I'm not saying Paul was being dramatic, but just, just imagine Paul sitting there and he's looking and it's, he's not getting anywhere. He's trying to preach the truth, but they're not listening to him patiently. They're cutting him off. They're accusing him of things. They're not listening. So God, so God gives him wisdom. He's like, I want to play him against each other. I love that story. Um, Philippians 3, 4, chapter 3, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, on and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Okay? He knew the law. He, like I said, he's a religious man. Concerning zeal, he's very zealous persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. I did this verse once again, just pushing it that he was a Pharisee. He was a religious man. Um, also, just a side note for information, circumcised the eighth day. Why did they circumcise the babies the eighth day? Because that's when the bud, uh, bud, blood would clot. Your blood would start clotting the eighth day, a baby's would. So you wouldn't circumcise them until the eighth day. Need information that I was told. Turn to Acts 22, 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous towards God, as ye all are this day, and I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem, for to be to punished. See, Baal lived a Pharisee, he was very zealous. He was very passionate about doing the work of the Lord. He thought he was doing the work of the Lord. Okay? So as we see there, um, when Paul says that, going back to chapter 26 in Romans, Paul was saying, I, religion, I lived a Pharisee. It wasn't just like I was part of some club. 
Yeah, it's kind of part of some club. Oh, my father was a Pharisee and his father before him. You know, it's just something that I do. No, he lived to be a Pharisee. He was very zealous in what he did. Okay. Acts 26, 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto your fathers. Okay. There's a change in his life. You read about him, a little bit about him, we'll get into a little bit more about him persecuting the church. But right there he said, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. You go in the Old Testament, Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament. Okay. This was prophesied way back when for Jesus to come and die for the sins of the world. It's a great hope and promise. They didn't get it back then. 2 Timothy 3.10 But though, for thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, is what Paul's been going through once he got saved, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecution I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall shuffle, shall suffer persecution. If I can get the word out, okay. They will suffer persecution. You will be judged by the lost world. Okay, living godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer. It's the changed life. Evidence of repentance is a changed life, and you will be judged, just like Paul was brought before King Agrippa to be judged. Luke six twenty two. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Why was Paul there before King Agrippa? He was preaching Jesus Christ. Right? When you preach Jesus Christ, all those things are going to happen to you. Uh, people are going to separate you from their company. Uh, I was a false convert. And we're going to get through this because the whole teaching is showing how Paul was a false convert, but God set him straight. Okay, I was a false convert. I was lost professing to be a Christian. Paul was lost confessing to follow God and do what God wanted, what God wants. Okay. So, blessed are ye. Okay, when you preach the true gospel, people are going to separate themselves from you. They don't like the true gospel. They like their easy believism. They like their workspace because they feel like they're earning it. So it's, it's, if you've ever built something with your hands and you give God the glory and you thank Him uh, for giving you the materials, for giving you the skills, and you build something, you have a little pride. I hope I'm using the right word. You take great joy in what you've done. You feel like you've accomplished something. And they take that and they twist it and, and get people to feel that way when it comes to working their way to heaven. Okay? They're accomplishing something. No, they're going to hell. Whose damnation is just because they thought they could buy God's grace. Right? It's like saying trying to buy love. Uh, you really upset people when you try to do that. And you can never buy love. You can't buy God's grace. Okay? So... He's standing there because for Jesus Christ. He's being judged because of Jesus Christ. Acts 26, 7. Next verse. Unto which promise are twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come? For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. He's being accused for preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. That hope. That blessed hope. And we have another blessed hope. Uh, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Now that we're saved, we have another blessed hope. I just don't want that being confused. Colossians 1.23 If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Minister. The gospel's hope, the hope of the gospel. People trying to get you to doubt your salvation, the true gospel, okay? They're trying to get you to doubt things, but the true gospel 
So many people, they stand for a repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you. And then you have Satan through his servants, the wolves in sheep's clothing, come and start whispering in their ear, you know what, that repentance, it's a work. No, you know what, repentance is not the sorrow in the heart. It's, it's just going from unbelief to belief. You're really only saved by your belief. And oh, that confessing both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord, that's works. That wasn't necessary. You only needed to believe. That's the only way you got saved. The other stuff was like extra. You know, it wasn't necessary. You didn't have to do it. And these people are falling away from the true gospel going, maybe they're right. Maybe it was just belief. Only belief. Okay? You gotta stand your ground. Okay? Stand for the true gospel. Stand for the true Jesus the Godhead. They're gonna pull you away from him. Um, Paul is holding his ground, unwavering, okay? This is why I'm here, and I'm not backing down. Turn back, uh, go back to Acts 26, verse 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And I'm not going through all the verses, but if you read and study, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Then it talks about God the Father raising him from the dead. What is that? That's the Godhead. These three are one. Not in one. Are one. That's important. But Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Wouldn't that include the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes, it would. Mark 10, 27, another account. And Jesus looked upon them and saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. They had to mention it twice. Anything, anytime something's mentioned more than once, everything's important, don't get me wrong, but when something's mentioned more than once, it's really trying to drive it home and get it through our heads and get it down to our hearts. Uh, with God all things are possible. Luke 1, 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. A third time. Okay. Luke 18, 27. And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. All things are possible with God. And they were denying the resurrection, the Jews were. They were denying Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Remember he played the Pharisees against the Sadducees? So go back to Acts 26, 9. Okay. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Contrary. Okay, he was attacking Jesus. He thought he was doing God's service, calling out a false prophet, a guy that's false, and he was doing God's service. People today doing things contrary to the name of the real Jesus. The Godhead, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, eternal security, Bible version issue, ETC, etc. People trying to go it their own way, fighting Jesus, trying to find him. Put a question mark there. Some people are fighting Jesus when they're trying to find him. And like I did, I truly came broken, found, God showed me, and I found, because remember if it be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. I found the true gospel of Jesus Christ through a faithful King James Bible ministry, believing ministry. And I got saved. God saved me. I came to Him broken. Okay? But a lot of people think that they're going to be standing, they're standing hardcore for the Trinity, when, and they think they're doing God's service, and they're not. They're standing for post or mid-trib. They're, they're standing for workspace salvation, like they don't believe in eternal security, the Bible version issue. You know, We stand for these things because we know, after doing the studies and believing in this book is God's perfect written word, we, God shows us truth. And once we know the truth, we stand for it. We know what we believe because it's backed by Scripture. Okay. Acts 26.10. Remember, he was doing things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 26.10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death. Paul caused Christians to be put to death. I gave my voice against them. 
He was saying, kill him. Kill him. How dare you come go against our God. Kill him. If you think about it, in this book, uh, the New Testament, Paul was the greatest false convert, thinking he was doing God's service. Okay? He was killing Christians. And he was all for it. See, that's the big issue when they say, well, the word, when we're going to get down here, the word repentance isn't used. So Paul didn't actually repent. Um, what are we reading right there? He's killing Christians, and he's very zealous for what he's doing. Acts 8.1. Go back to Acts 8.1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. This is talking about Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church was at, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay? When it says there, and... Um, Consenting unto his death, Paul's saying, kill him. Kill Stephen. He's a heretic. Kill him. And this great persecution, we're going to find out that Paul was the big, was a great weapon the Pharisees were using against Jesus Christ and the Christians back then. Okay, Paul was cheering almost all the time. Kill him. Kill him. Bring them before them. Kill him. They're worthy of death. They're going against God. Okay. Uh, if you ever uh, Seminole Stream Band, they, uh, Lord I'll Wait is the is the um, album. They talk, of, they have a song in there that I love because it really pierces the heart. And the, the lyrics are: "Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers." When you're lost, you're against Jesus Christ. When you finally come to the, your, the end of your self-righteousness and pride, you realize that I've sinned against God, I'm a, and I'm no longer against you, Lord, I need you. Okay? How do you think Paul felt? Okay? And I hear, my, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Paul went from being a false convert being truly saved. There's a lot of us out there, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we weren't taught the truth, but God brought us to the truth, and we accepted it almost like that because we wanted the truth. Something was wrong with our lives as a professing Christian. Something just wasn't right. Okay? Acts 26.11, back to Acts 26.11. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Two parts of there you need to realize. I, and compelled them to blaspheme. Turn their back on um, Jesus Christ. To denounce them. Uh, who today gets you to turn your back on the true Jesus Christ of Scripture? And they were killing people if they didn't. The Catholic Church. They were killing people who didn't accept the Eucharist and say, that's Jesus Christ, that bread is Jesus Christ, and that wine is His blood, physical, real, body and blood of Jesus Christ, and people were getting killed. They were getting killed for this word. They were trying to get them to turn against God's word. Okay? Talking about blaspheming God's word. So He caused them to be blasphemed, getting them to recant, to turn on their belief. And it says here, the second part is, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So it wasn't just the Jewish cities. He went to Gentile cities, heathen cities, and persecuted and was rounding up Christians. Okay. John 16, 2. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. That's what Paul was doing. He was so zealous and passionate about what he was doing, he was going to strange cities. How broken do you think Paul felt after salvation, looking back at the old man, what he had done? A lot of things weighed heavy on Paul's heart. Notice how Paul persecuted him to strange cities. 
And I almost want to say mad against him, you know. Uh, he was very passionate. Acts 9, 31. Then had the churches rest. This is how, when you read this, this is how you know how zealous Paul was for what he was doing before he got saved. Killing Christians, getting them to recant, telling them that what they believed was false. Okay. 931, after Paul's conversion. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. That's why I said that he was like a great weapon for Satan, and he thought he was doing God's service. And when Jesus set him straight, and he dropped his self-righteousness and obeyed the Lord, what happened there? Then had the church's rest. If he wasn't that big of a soldier, you know, he wasn't that big of a deal, why did the church have rest? Because he was very zealous going around, rounding them up and having them killed left and right. All right. Back to Acts 26, 12. This is his lost life, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, like I said, two things. He was killing people who believed in Jesus Christ. He was killing Christians, and he was getting Christ uh, Christians to turn their back on their faith. I believe Paul is a good example of a false convert before he got saved. And you've got people coming out of false systems like Catholicism. Some of you guys came out of Catholicism. Some came out of the Mormon Church, Jehovah's Witness. You come out of these occults and you've probably done some bad things but you can still get saved no matter what happens God can still save you Acts 26 12 whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest okay, he was very loyal to the wrong people okay once again, Paul is showing us an example of how misled a sincerely wrong person can be. He thought he was doing God's service. Paul, despite his zeal, did not know the true capital G God. And Jesus Christ is capital G God. He's not God the Son, Jesus Christ who is capital G God. And you read over in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 that there's only one capital G God, the Father. He did not know the true God. He was worship, He was doing the service of the lowercase g God. Okay? He was very religious. He was sincerely deceived. Okay? We've read through, this is the account of his lost life. 1 Timothy 1.13, who was before, this is Paul speaking, who was before a blasphemer, speaking against Jesus Christ. And a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He didn't know the truth. Jesus showed him the truth. He repented. We're going to see this. He believed. Okay? He's talking to God. What must I do? Okay? That's talking. I know prayer is all prayer is is you talking to Jesus Christ. God the Father through Jesus Christ. One mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. Back to Acts 26, verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. Here's the conversion. Above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? This is Jesus talking. Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. How many times have we read that, and how many of us have not really looked it up? What's the pricks? Okay. Paul is thinking he's doing God's service. Okay. The metaphor is a very plain one. The ox goad. I'll have some pictures shown. The ox goad was a formidable weapon, some seven or eight feet in length, shod with an iron point and capable of being used as a spear, it can be used as a weapon, and of inflicting deadly wounds as a pit, pinch. Held in the firm hand of the plowman, you've got the two ox down there, and he's holding this thing, I've had pictures, like a spear. It presented a sharp point to the rebellious animal under the yoke. 
If the ox had readily yielded to the gentle prick, just the gentle tap, given, not in anger, but for guidance, okay? You don't want to kill your ox. You're doing it to train them and guide them and get them to do what you tell them to do. It had been well. But if it lashed out with its hooves against the point, what does it get but bleeding flanks? It gets stabbed. Okay? Paul was kicking against the pricks. God is saying you're trying to do, you think you're doing, and you're trying to do God's service, but you're not really doing it. You're fighting against God. You're kicking against the pricks. The goat is a traditional farming implement used to spur or guide livestock, usually oxen, which are pulling a plow or cart, used also to round up cattle. It is a type of long stick with a pointed end, also known as the cattle prod. Today we have cattle prods electricity. But back then they had a like a spear with a point, and you'll see that you see the picture. Okay? That's what it means by saying Paul was kicking against the pricks. Paul thought he was doing God's service. But what he was really doing was fighting God. Okay? That's what God, Jesus was saying. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, these goats, or not goats, sorry, oxen, when they fought back, it was pointless. You fight back hard enough, you're going to get stabbed, and eventually you could get killed. Okay? By getting stabbed too hard. So, Paul thought he was being used of God, but in truth was fighting God, kicking against the pricks. I thought that was interesting to look up what the pricks was talking about in detail. Sometimes you just go, uh-huh, yep, that's great, Lord. But sometimes it's great to actually look it up and see it in more detail. It takes time, brothers and sisters in Christ, doing word studies, um, expository studies, uh, subject studies. Okay, It takes time to study the Bible, and the biggest thing that I was lazy about before I got saved, because I would learn that these Bible versions, there was just something wrong with them, we barely read them, or we just read, read them and go, uh-huh, 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 is word studies. Words have meaning, and you read the King James Bible, and you say, hey, that's an interesting word. My wife and I were doing our morning devotions in Psalms, and we came across the word, where is it? Uh, Psalms 7, 16. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealings shall come down upon his own pate, P-A-T-E. And you look up the definition, it's a small part of the head. It's just another way of saying it's going to be upon his own head. It's going to come down on him. It's his fault. He's got nobody to blame. But we looked up that word because we didn't know what it means. We're not just going to go, okay, it's in the Word of God. It's got to be good. It's got to be truth, which it is. It's always good to look up the words. Okay. okay. Acts 26, 15. Back to Acts 26. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now you've heard the story being told. Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus per se. He was killing Christians. He was persecuting men uh, and women, uh, persecuting the body of Christ. He didn't realize that. But by persecuting the body of Christ, he was persecuting Jesus Christ. We are flesh of his flesh and bones of his bones. Okay? Paul was fighting against God. And through all this with the pricks, Paul was fighting against God, who, Jesus Christ, who is God, and he was only hurting himself, leading to destruction. God had grace with Paul. Uh, Acts 26, 16, But rise, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this perfect purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things, which thou hast seen, he's seen Jesus Christ, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, deliver thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness, turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. I'll be doing a study on children of light versus children of darkness, okay? 
to turn them from darkness to light. Okay, darkness, we'll read sometimes, is a reference to Satan, whereas light is a reference to Jesus Christ a lot. But it's also a reference from being lost. Okay, when you're lost, you're, you're, the, uh, you're basically worshiping the lowercase g God of this world. You can be an atheist and say, I don't believe in God, but you're really serving Satan. Okay. So, it's often a reference also to lost versus saved. He's supposed to turn the lost to Jesus Christ. Okay? From the power of Satan, see, unto God. Okay? When we're lost, we're under the power of Satan. Notice it says, unto God. There is no saved going, you can't be saved and then you get led to salvation and you're saved. You're lost. You've got to repent and fall on your knees and admit that you are a sinner and having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God. Okay? You get turned from darkness to light. You get turned to Jesus Christ. God, and to, uh, turned from the power of Satan unto God. Jesus Christ, the gospel. Okay? That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. Okay? Paul was chosen by God, and God told him, this is what's going to happen, this is what you're going to do. Uh, Acts 26, 19. Now here's the key. People say, well, he didn't repent. Well, if he didn't repent, he would have blown God off. Jesus Christ, ah, oh, you're not real. You're not, not, I'm, I'm not sorry for what I did. I'm going to continue doing it. Read what it says here. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Vision. He dropped his self-righteousness. He realized what he was doing was wrong, and Jesus is God. Okay? We just read what kind of Pharisee Paul was. If you remember what we said, he was strict, he was passionate, he was very zealous for what he was doing, religious, and he was killing Christians. He was getting them to recant and turn against Jesus Christ. Okay? He had to drop his self-righteousness. Self -righteousness. Okay? He had to realize he was zealous in the wrong direction. He was passionate in the wrong direction. He's supposed to be zealous for Jesus Christ, which he did after salvation. He became very zealous for Jesus Christ. He became very passionate about the gospel and preaching the gospel. Acts 26, 20, the next verse. But showed first unto them at Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. Did Paul have works meet for repentance? Was he still killing Christians? Was he still getting people to go against Jesus Christ and recant? Was he still zealous for the Pharisee and the system that they stood for? Or did he truly repent? Doesn't it have to always say he repented. You can see the action. You can see the fruit. Notice what it says there. Works meet for repentance, and do works meet for repentance. The uh, Bible also talks about uh, fruit. Uh, their fruit, by their fruit you shall know them. Okay? The changed life. Paul was finding God thinking he was serving him. Paul had a choice to make. Repent and believe in Jesus. You know, be obedient to the heavenly vision. Or be disobedient to the heavenly vision and continue to persecute Jesus. Turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, as we saw in verse 18. He had a choice to stay in the darkness. He had a choice to stay under the power of Satan. Now, as we read in the Bible, power, uh, Satan still has to answer to God. But God says he's the lowercase g God of this world. Okay? Satan has no power to keep you from getting saved. None. Okay, that's why it says there that you can that Paul's going to go out and preach the gospel and you're going to turn people from darkness to light. You're going to turn people from the power of Satan to God. The only one to blame for not getting saved is those out there that refuse to repent and believe. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we've done that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That we've come to the truth, the knowledge of the truth, and God turned us from being a fake and a fraud, I was one of them, to being true, for being real, following the real Jesus, 
having a changed life, I, it's hard to explain. It really is. Um, and I'm talking about the feeling in your heart when you truly, truly get saved and you realize you were lost. You have anger. You're angry against the people who lied to you. Being raised in these Babel buildings, being taught an antichrist, a fake Jesus. Right? Being taught to be worldly, that you can be a Christian and be worldly. There was no changed life. You're running 90 miles an hour, and then anytime you slow down, you start getting miserable, and then you start running 90 miles an hour again, so you can hide from that miserable feeling. I didn't realize how lonely I was as a, as a, fall, as a professing Christian. Uh, now that I have Jesus Christ in me, okay, some people was like, well, you have the Holy Spirit in you, but the Bible says you have Jesus in you. Jesus says, I will be with you, okay? Jesus in me, I'm no longer alone, okay? Now God blessed me with a wife, a wonderful Bible-believing, God-fearing woman. So God will watch over you, but Jesus Christ is in me, and I'm not alone, I have brothers and sisters in Christ now. I'm actually part of the body of Christ. I have brothers and sisters out there now. True both brothers and sisters out there. I have true fellowship. I'm not alone. We're all part of the body of Christ. Now don't get me wrong, you can still feel alone in these last days because we're so spread thin, true Bible-believing Christians. But remember, Paul had a changed life. He repented in his heart. He chose to turn from darkness to light. He chose to turn from the power of Satan unto God. Okay. For Acts 26, 21. Next verse. For, the, for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me, having therefore obtained help of God. Okay. I continue unto this day, witnessing both the, to small and great, saying none other thing than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Jesus is the light. When we have Jesus in us, we shine to the lost world to give them hope. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to live the life you're living. Okay? There is better. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, and Brother and Sister Christ will be honest with the lost people, but I'm being honest with you. Uh, becoming a Christian doesn't mean everything's perfect. Everything's great. Okay? Like you're living high on the hog, as they say. Um, hope that's not a bad statement. Uh, I'm still learning. Um, basically, you're not living it up and having just all this joy and peace and like party time and whatnot. Okay. Now, the one thing I put down here is God helped him when the Jews in the temple went about to kill him. No, no, no. no. The Romans did. Remember, the captain put his hand on him and said, "Okay, we're bringing him inside." There was a time where Paul, the Jews, sought to kill Paul, and he was let down in a basket. So it was brethren. It was brethren that saved Paul. No, God's the one that saved Paul every time. Okay, Acts 9, I want to go to Acts 9, verse 19. I think this is the story I want to talk about. Acts 9, verse 19, and we're going to read to 25. And when he had received meat, and he was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God, capital G, God. I always do that in my studies, because I'm just really adamant about there being only one God, the Father. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on him? this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. See, Paul had a changed life. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But, they, but their lying a a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. 
Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. That's the story I was talking about. No, 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 no. Right here, see right here? It said the disciples saved him. No, Paul knows how to give God the glory in everything. And that's what you and I are supposed to be doing, brothers and sisters in Christ. We give God the glory for everything. God saved Paul. And it wasn't the only time he saved Paul. Acts chapter 23. Okay, um, kind of don't want to read it. You guys can read it on your time, okay? Um, bottom line, God saved him again. I forgot to write down the exact verses, and the whole chapter is a long chapter. It's a good read. The whole Bible is great. But you can see how God saved him again, and you can easily say, no, 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 this person saved him, or that person saved him, okay? The soldiers saved him. No, Paul gave credit to God for saving him, okay? 1 Corinthians 1 27 but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen yea things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, uh, glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Did you notice the change in Paul's life? From his lost life, he'd never give God the glory. Jesus Christ, the glory. Okay? Um, because he was fighting Jesus. But after salvation, he's given God the glory. God saved me. Okay. I have no doubt when he was a Pharisee, he was giving the, his wisdom. And remember, I think we read the verse where he counted it all for naught. Everything that he was, a Pharisee, everything he'd been taught, it was worthless. But he relied on that when he was false. False convert, a fake, a Pharisee. He didn't give God the glory. He gave his wisdom the glory. He was very zealous. Look at all the work I'm doing. It's my works. Giving himself glory. Now he gives God all the glory. Acts 26. Back to Acts 26. Once again, another evidence of a changed life. Acts 26, verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself... Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. You read through this Bible when it talks about being a bishop, you have to be sober. Except we read a lot, my, my wife and I, which is a blessing. But we went through Timothy. Uh, first and second Timothy where it's talking about uh, being a bishop. It's talking about being sober. It says it a lot um, To be a deacon you're supposed to be sober um, as a Christian you're supposed to be sober and vigilant okay. He's saying that I speak words of truth I'm speaking words of truth I'm not drunk. I'm not mad. You're gonna be called crazy for standing for truth um, it's 1 Samuel, for, let's go back to the Old Testament for a second. 1 Samuel 1, 8 through 16. Let's give it, let's look at an Old Testament example where someone thought somebody was drunken with wine when they weren't. Let's see. First Samuel 1. Some people might know where I'm going. 1 Samuel 1, verse 8. Uh, no, I'm in 2 Samuel. That's why I was like, that's not what I want. Story of Samuel is what we want at the beginning. 1 Samuel 1 8. Then said Elk. 
Canna, her husband, to her, Hannah, okay, it's Hannah we're talking about, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thou heart, thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? She didn't have any sons. So Anna, Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. She was, how many of us pray, but it's almost like we talk out loud sometimes, or we, our mouth moves as we're praying. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Okay, it's a great example of somebody looking at someone and saying you're drunk when they weren't she's pouring out her heart we pull out our heart not just to the lord but to the lost world trying to preach truth to them and they're going to look at us and think we're mad okay they're going to treat you like you're crazy you've lost your mind just like uh festus has uh, people will think you're crazy to stand for the kjv and the true gospel that's the truth how many of you guys out there can attest to the truth? That's the truth. Acts 26, 26. For the king knoweth all these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner, hidden. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. See, it's tough. You're going to have experiences where you feel like you're almost about to reach somebody. But notice Paul said he, would, he doesn't mind that. Why? He wants them to get saved, but I can't remember, yeah, uh, people you think you are getting through to, almost, okay, almost. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Planting seeds is what we do, and you never know if you are watering a seed, planting the seed, and the, uh, watering a seed that was planted by another Christian. It's in, it's in his head, and it's trying to make it to his heart, the true gospel. And someone planted that seed up here, and you come along and water that seed, and it makes it down to here. It roots, if you want to say, and the roots come down to the heart. It's no longer just in the head. Okay, That's the almost part. The seed gets planted. Then the watering, the actual were as mean, let's see. Then Agrippa said, Paul, almost, thou per almost persuades me. But he says, but all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am. Okay, seed gets planted, it gets watered, and it roots down in the heart. Okay, there's a lot of seeds that get planted, and they never, they don't want the water. They, it's just a seed, and it doesn't do any good if it doesn't grow. So Paul's saying, uh, I'm going to plant seeds. And whether they almost be converted or they truly get converted, that's what he wants. Okay. Acts 26.30 And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. 
Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Now, that's the testimony of Paul. Was Paul a false convert? Yes, he was a false convert. He's the biggest example of a false convert. And true conversion, turning to Jesus Christ, proof of it is a changed life. Okay, repentance is a big part. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 through 18. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but, uh, I almost want to say Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus, Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Remember we read earlier about going from the power of Satan or, and to the power of God, from darkness to light? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Right? Paul had to go out there and he had to start preaching the gospel knowing that it had fallen deaf ears. He's planting seeds. And you read the story about Paul when he's preaching the gospel. He reaches people, but then the religious leaders and everything come in and start sowing seeds of destruction. And, and Jesus gives a great the parable of the, of the seeds that fall everywhere and explains how they can come in and snatch that seed away. Paul's almost reaching people and then someone comes along and ruins it, takes that seed away. Okay. Or the roots never make it all the way down to the heart. They're shallow. Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 22. Twenty-three to twenty-eight. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, "Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands." Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though, I, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move, and having our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. When you go to preach the gospel, Paul understood that for that seed to really take hold and start rooting and coming down to the heart, that person had to be ready. ready. He had to be seeking truth. He had to be seeking God. There's got to be more to this life. We can plant seeds, but if the people aren't seeking truth, that seed's going to set there, and nothing's going to happen. Uh, Satan can come along and take that seed out, or it just sets there, okay? You've got to be seeking the truth, and Paul knew it. You're going to come across people that are going to be seeking truth, and you're going to see it, and you're going to be so happy and joyful when you're preaching the gospel to somebody who's truly seeking truth. They're not contentious, they're not trying to debate, they're not asking question after question, cutting you off, and they're not listening patiently. You're going to have impatient people, and you're going to have people that are patient. Okay? That's why I read that for you, that you're seeking, that they're seeking God. You're going to come across people that are seeking God. 2 Corinthians 11.17 okay? This is the part I was talking about, being honest 
And brothers and sisters in Christ, you understand, and this is to the baby Christians as well as the mature Christians, okay? Your life as a Christian is not going to be party time. Okay? It's not going to be all, you know, sunshine and, and like perfect in paradise. 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. If a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we have been weak, howbeit whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Now, what he's talking about there is... You're not always supposed to be jumping up and down saying, you know, I did this, I suffered this for Jesus Christ, I did this, I did this, uh, God did this for me. There's good testimonies, but there's times where people like to do that. You'll see them stand up and it's just, look what I did, look what I did for the Lord, and I did this and that, and it's a pride issue. And he's saying when he's telling us this next stuff, it's not a pride issue, he's being foolish. But it's important for you to realize what it means to be a Christian. He's boasting foolishly in the sense that it's not a pride thing. He's not saying, look at me and what I had to go through for Jesus Christ, like I'm so great. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor is more abundant, and stripes above measures, in prisons more frequent, and out of prisons, and death oft, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeys often, and his journeys preaching the gospel, and journeys often, and perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, Take that to heart. Uh, one of the big things is when you get saved, and we know this, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that uh, you're going to family turn against you. And perils by heathens, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness. I think that's the next one. Wilderness. Thank you, Lord. And perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. There's another key. You're going to have professing Christians trying to mess you up and turn against you. And weariness and painfulness, and watching often, and hunger and thirst, and fasting often, and cold and nakedness. All this stuff is based off the changed life. Paul had a changed life. He was a false convert, and he turned to Jesus Christ. I was a false convert, and I turned to the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. And ever since then, God has given me joy, and He's given me peace. But it's not this worldly fake joy, and it's not this worldly fake peace. And he made me to understand that standing for this book, it's going to be, I'm going to face, suffer hardship, and I'm going to suffer for Jesus Christ. Standing for the major doctrine, standing for instruction in righteousness, the changed life trying to live for God is going to turn people away. Okay? You're going to family turn against you. Friends, you're going to have uh, false Christians like I was when I truly got saved. A lot of the pe professing Christians don't want to have anything to do with me today. Uh, false brethren will turn against you. Um, so I would want to do this study to let you know that there's a lot of us out there that were false converts and I'm so, and I'm not lifting myself up, I'm lifting you up and encouraging you. I'm proud that we can get saved. We can get led falsely and be false converts and God still has the grace and mercy to show us the truth and help us to get saved. We still go from darkness to light, the power of Satan, unto God, the power of God, which is salvation, God's grace, saving you and saving me. So thank you for going with me. I just really wanted to get this out to show that there are false converts and there are false converts that can still get saved. Okay? You can have people standing hardcore for the wrong thing. I praise the Lord when I gave out my Trinity studies 
there was people that came to me and said, you're right, I was using false concepts, and I, I kind of believed the Godhead just like I did, but I was using false terms and was getting confused on certain issues because I was bringing in false terms and a title for God that wasn't in the Bible. So they were false like I was, standing for the Trinity. God showed in the light, truth, and they turned to the truth. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, stand, stand, stand for the true gospel. And it's not a waste to preach the gospel to a false convert. Preach the gospel to Catholics. Preach the, go preach the gospel to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. But sometimes you're going to come across people that you think are be uh, Bible-believing Christians, and you get to the point where you just don't know. It's that point where you don't really see the fruits of repentance. Uh, works meet for repentance. You don't see the changed life. Um, you see that they're wavering and starting to turn uh, against absolute truth. And no matter how much you try to tell them, teach truth to them, they don't want to hear it. But they claim to be Bible-believing Christians. When you get to that point, don't cast your pearls before swine and teach them and, uh, the true gospel and give the true gospel to them. God can still save a false convert. He saved Paul. If he can save a false convert like Paul, killing Christians and getting Christians to turn against Jesus Christ and denounce him, he can save you. And I'm talking about these false Christians out there when I say you. But he did save some of you brothers and sisters in Christ out there. So, preach the gospel and minister of reconciliation. Let's get out there brothers and sisters in Christ and get on top of this preaching the gospel. You look what's going on in the world and things are getting bad out there. Um, there's two, there's uh, India is about to be, I mean, they're just this close. 80% of their cash is gone. They have, uh, they got rid of all their currency except for like what we call in America $1 bills and quarters. And they have this program that they're going to. I'll be doing another video on it. Um, there's countries on the verge of being cashless, part of a cashless system. And the UN is connected to it. And the UN is running it all. China's getting close. And if you look at China and India, the two greatest population, that's almost half the population of the world. It's about to be cashless. It's not the mark of the beast. They keep calling it the mark of the beast. It's not the mark of the beast. But that system is there. We are in the last days. Jesus is coming back any day now. We need to be focusing on preaching the gospel to people, leaving gospel tracts everywhere handing gospel tracts out. God gives you the courage and tells you to go preach the gospel to somebody. Trust the Lord that he'll give you the right words and the courage to do it. So, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ out there. Grace and peace be with you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My love for you in Christ Jesus. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I love the lost world, as I know you do, by preaching the gospel to them, by preaching truth to them. So I'll see you in the next big study.